Grand Prix, which we are very, very excited about, and we will be talking about that quite a bit here. But we are going to start things off with some standard action. It's round one of, yes, 11 here from Columbus, Ohio. Cedric Phillips, Patrick Sullivan, Nick Miller in the sideboard at SCG Live for your tweets along with the hashtag of SCGCOL. We are underway in round number one. A plane's here for Nelson. And Nelson's opponent, Tom Judge, is playing White Splash Black Devotion. This is a White Devotion list hubbed around things like Burmaz, uh, Archetype of Courage, ramping into some large things like High Sentinels, Avacyn, Soul Theros, touching Black for just one copy of Athreos in the main deck and two copies of Sora and Solemn Visitor. A Battlewise Hot Blade is going to come down here for Nelson. That's kind of the giveaway, right? Summons up. Unless, you know, you're just kind of playing that thing. Here's a gold creature, or excuse me, a creature that stops a gold creature in Soldier of the Pantheon. So makes things a little bit interesting as the land it looks like was a copy of Nykthos. We will go back to Nelson, who will draw a card, and we'll see if he can make that hoplite pretty big. Well, the big issue is he can give it flying or some other form of evasion here because the Soldier of the Pantheon is going to keep this locked down for the time being. Probably not a card Brad expected to see this early or wanted to see this early. Probably true. Of course, whenever you do target the hot play, it gets a plus one, plus one counter, and you get to scry. So some nice value there. Nelson's going to play a hero of Iros. He's also going to play an island. Looks like he's in the development phases. Not able to make a creature huge just yet. We'll pass the turn back. As far as the, you know, the targeting he has with Heroic, four copies of Defiant Strike, four gods willing, two feet of resistance, four copies of Ordeal of Thassa, an Ordeal of Heliata, Stratus Walk, an Aqueous Form, and a Singing Bell Strike who wants to get a little bit crafty, as here is a Nyxlus Ram. And this white-black devotion list is very good at gumming up the ground. Uh, you're seeing Tom deploy a lot of blockers here. I believe he's about to miss his third land drop. Very aggressive attack here. Yeah, he is coming in for two. Nelson's going to go down to 18. No interest in blocking. Back to Nelson. We will go, as you did mention, Judge does miss a land drop last turn. And with Tom missing a land drop, I think I would prefer to hang back on defense. He just wants to give himself as much time as possible to draw lands and get, it, get himself out of this. So I prefer holding back on defense. A Defiant Strike will target here of Iros. You do see the plus one, plus one counter placed on there. Nelson will play a Plains after drawing a card, of course, with a cantrip. This is an ordeal of Thassa. The elevator moves up. Now there are two counters on that. And we know what happens when the third counter goes on there. Oh, yeah. The ordeal is complete. Yes. And of course, the ordeal there only costs one mana, because when you do target here of Iros with an aura, it costs one less. This was one of the big. This was the big kind of heroic enabler that got printed. So I think this, this was the card that if heroic was going to be a deck, it was going to involve Hero Varos in, in heavy frequency. There is the two mana 2-2. Two, two. It is a 5-5 five, five now that it's just drawn two cards. So it's doing pretty well for itself as Nelson looks like he's got some more things to do here in the second main phase. Already reaching for some mana. Dealt Judge five points of damage. There's another copy of the hero. And Brad says, that's, uh, that's it for me. The ram is going to trigger. Judge is going to go up to 16. We'll see if he can find a land here. And an issue here with Tom's deck is he's light on removal. Really only a suspension field, three copies of Banishing Light, and two copies of Mass Calcify in his main deck. Mass Calcify, Oof. not good in this matchup. So getting these large creatures off the table is going to be problematic. A lot of Tom's deck is devoted to trying to block or gum up the ground. And that's not going to work with Brad generating 5-5s five and 6-6s six and 7-7s. Seven Another attack here for two. Nelson's going to go on a 16. Again, no interest in blocking as he, do, as he does draw a card. Looks like it may have another copy of Ordeal of Thassa. Very interesting deck the Blue Ever Road deck is because to me it feels like, you know, a lot of people know this deck exists. It's a deck that got played at the Block Pro Tour. But, you know, outside of that, we haven't seen it in Standard very much and you know you're wondering did it get the necessary pieces to get going here is now here's a bestowed eidolon of countless Ooh. battles so yeah now we're really building ordeal of thoughts is going to target this here Iros. it's almost like the battle wise hot plate isn't there but luckily for nelson he's got some non multicolored creatures that he can get to work with here exactly and this deck undisrupted which is you know what tom's deck allows him to do essentially can do some really explosive things that you're seeing right now in brad's drawing two making a bunch of eight hates. This is, this is good stuff here. There you do see Island of Countless Battles, and each enchanted creature gets plus one, plus one for each creature you control, and plus one, plus one for each aura you control. This was a card when spoiled from Born of the Gods. A lot of people are expecting this to be seeing a lot more play. Don't know the exact home for this one just yet. Might be here, though. Well, if it's going to be good anywhere, it's going to be here. I mean, Brad's playing with a bunch of cheap creatures and a bunch of auras. This is the infrastructure for, for the Eidolon that people anticipated. It's asking for a lot of moving parts, so it's not the easiest card to incorporate into decks, but just like Hero, once you've built the deck, it's an enormous payoff. Yeah. 
We'll see some blocking. It looks like initially this ram is going to get flattened there by the larger hero. Nelson's going to play a flooded shred and sacrifice it. So down to 15, he's going to go. Judge is down to nine. Nelson will search up a planes. And Flooded Strand was also a big enabler for this deck. It's a subtle thing, but the mana has just never been very good in these heroic decks. And a land that allows you to find blue or white mana on the first turn, which this deck needs, is a huge, huge upgrade. Seeker of the Way does come into play. Nelson passing the turn back. A Plains off the top here for Judge. You do mention the mana base. Four Flooded Strands, two Tranquil Coves, four Temple of Enlightenment, nine Plains, two Islands, and only a single mana confluence. As here's a Bramaz from Judge. And only playing one copy of Mana Confluence is a declaration that Brad thinks the mana is fine as is. I was a little surprised, too. And a lot of that has to go to Flooded Strand. Already reaching for some mana. There's another Eidolon in Countless Battles and gets the Trigger Bestow. Mm. You know what that is? Good deck building. That's right. This is also a lot of damage. That's also true. A very large attack here. And it looks like Judge is going to be on the defensive as he's got some real blocking to do now. I'm pretty sure every block here is a chump block. And yeah, Nelson's going to cast a copy of Feet of Resistance, it looks like here. And that is going to get the job done. Brad Nelson's going to win game number one here with Blue Eyed Heroic over Tom Judge playing White Black Devotion. As we are going to head over to the sideboards, we will take a look at Judge's first as he will be on the play. So he does have some upgrading to do here, which is good for him. He has two copies of Devouring Light, two Suspension Fields, a Hushwing Griff, an Archetype of Courage, two Erase, two Reprisal, an Elspeth Sun's Champion, a Scuttling Doom Engine, two Last Breath, two Resolute Archangel. He needs more removal spells. And oddly enough, this is one of the few matches in Standard where I think both Last Breath and Reprisal can come in because Brad has cheap <laughs> creatures that then become very large, so that's nice. Alongside two copies of Devouring Light as well and the two Suspension Fields. Not all these removal spells work at all times, but Tom's deck game one is really absent of removal spells. Needs to change that even if they don't work 100% of the time. On Nelson's side of things, we've got two copies of Erase, a Heliod's Pilgrim, an Ordeal of Heliod, two Treasure Crews, two Laguna Van Trailblazer. That's a winning Laguna Van Trailblazer. Mm -hmm. That is now a champion after last week. Two of Johnny's Presence, three Stubborn Denial, a Seeker of the Way, and an additional copy of Aqueous's Form. Now, if you did read Tom Ross's article this week about heroic strategies, and this deck in particular he did mention, what you'll see here is a lot of the cards are extensions of his main deck. You know, he's got an Aqueous Form in his main and an Aqueous Form in his sideboard. He's got Seeker of the Way through him in main, one of them in the sideboard. So a lot of what he's doing here, you're not going to find you know, those big hate cards in the sideboard. You're going to find a lot of extensions of his main deck in his sideboard. Three Heliod's Pilgrim in his main deck, a fourth one in the board. Mm -hmm. That's what he's up to here. Now, as far as cards that he wants to board in, well, that's the tough part, because I haven't really seen this deck in action very much to decide what he does want to do here. I could see, you know, an argument for additional Aqueous form because it looks like, you know, the ground's going to get gummed up, so that'll let him push through some damage. That seems like the easiest place to start. The two cards that stand out to me are the Aqueous form, as you mentioned, because Tom's deck, at least game one, looked very good at blocking and not very good at killing stuff, so Aqueous form makes a lot of sense. I also see, think the fourth copy of Heliod's Pilgrim can come in here as well. Matchup's probably a little bit on the slower side, and you, if you're bringing the second Aqueous form, I think you just want to find as many copies of that card as possible. Yeah, I think that's probably the case, actually. I mean, it does seem like it's a very good card in this particular matchup. I am interested to see exactly how the Pilgrim will perform this weekend. You know, it's a card that... I know Todd Anderson tried it at the Pro Tour in combination with his Soul Artifact. Uh, not a great performance for Todd that weekend, unfortunately. But, you know, he kind of took a risk. And, you know, it, it looks better if it works out, of Exactly. Course. But we see here, you know, three of these in the main again, one of these in the sideboard. And plenty of targets. I think that's why we see the load of one ofs in, in this main deck here from Nelson. And I imagine Ross as well. You've got, again, the Ordeal of Heliata, Stratus Walk, and Aquasis Form, and a Singing Bell Strike is one of them in the main deck. And then four copies of Ordeal of Thassa. Probably the best ordeal for this strategy. Well, it's just more gas. And the Ordeal of Heliata, I'm sure, is a nice target to have in certain matchups, like against mono red strategies, but not something you want to draw a lot of against control decks. I imagine that's true. I do imagine that's true. I, I'm also very interested to see exactly how Eidolon of Countless Battles performs in this deck. I mean, it obviously looked good the last game. You know, is it just a good card overall? Is it good when everything is just, you know, working as it's supposed to? Can it be good on its own? You know, that's, I think, another interesting question as well. Well, it feels like one of those cards where if it's not powerful, it's pr probably no other card you could have been playing in its slot would have gotten you out of the particular spot you got yourself into. Okay. There's a lot of cards that that feel that way to me in these linear strategies of, yeah, sometimes it's not good for you, but if it's not good for you, it meant your deck was probably not functioning, not because that card wasn't powerful enough. To me, Idol on a Countless Battles is definitely a powerful enabler for these strategies, but sometimes you're going to run into just a sea of removal and it's not going to be very good, but when your heroic strategy is running into a lot of cheap removal spells, there's not another card you can have been playing to help you out there, most likely.
We talked about Nelson's mana base. One thing you'll note here as well, again, he does have six lands that do come into play tapped, four Temple of Enlightenment and two copies of Tranquil Cove. You'll notice he only has four one drops, just four copies of favorite hoplite. So, you know, he could have more one drops, things of that nature. He doesn't have that. Kind of looks like he's just starting on turn number two. Which is not ideal for these kind of strategies because a lot of your openings are turn one heroic creature into turn two enchantment and get the ball rolling. Brad's taking a somewhat slower approach, but I don't think that's too bad a deck that's playing with God's Willing and Ordeal of Thassa. So you have ways to generate card advantage and also ways to set up really powerful boards where you pass with one mana up. The God's Willing eats their entire turn, and then you can untap and start doing your thing. We do apologize briefly here for any technical dif difficulties, excuse me, that we do have, but we are getting those taken care of right now. But this is going to be a lot of fun to watch. Not only just this match, but I think this week, and we got 11 rounds of Magic. That's over 700 players, which is a lot mm -hmm. of players here in the Columbus Convention Center. We had players travel, as, and we figured this was, this was what was going to happen here, especially during season number four. Well, Columbus, Indianapolis, these are generally our largest spots on the Open Series. So not surprising to see a lot of turnout here because we're in Columbus, and there's a lot of people that are chasing points. And Standard feels like it's a new animal in yeah. Land of Ivan Jen's win last week. So big, big shakeups to the format are often good for people just saying, well, I have a new idea, maybe it's viable, or I think I can attack this new menace, or I want to play this deck myself. All these things help people come out to large events. Both players are going to take their hands. Again, Tom Judge will be on the play here. See two copies of Devouring Light, the last two cards that he picked up. Seems like an all-star in this matchup. Absolutely. I mean, it does play into God's Willing, but that's fine. Every removal spell is going to be good against Brad. Nelson going to send his hand back. I have a feeling that's something that this deck probably does a lot. Probably takes, like, you know, one mulligan, at least. I mean, it does seem, you know, it's kind of a, it's weird to say it's a combo deck because it's just creatures and auras, but it is kind of a combo deck. And you need blue and white mana very early on in the game, which is going to also influence your mulligans as well. Another thing to note about Tom's deck here is he has a main deck erase and two more in the sideboard. Those may have come in. Erase is not always going to be good because sometimes Brad is going to be going, doing his thing with heroic creatures that aren't enchantments and spells. So you can definitely draw too many copies of a card like erase. But again, I think that Tom needs to speed up his deck a little bit so some of the larger, clunkier creatures like Soul of Theros can probably get sideboarded out. And uh, the two copies of Mass Calcify are very easy to cut, so he has easy places to make some upgrades. The addition of a race to the main deck, I don't know if that's going to become ubiquitous, but it wouldn't surprise me if it does. I mean, Force of Crucifix, we saw Jeskai Ascendancy last week win, and, you know, plenty of enchantment targets in this format. I think, think about Theros, of course. It's very rare you're going to run into a deck that has nothing to do with it, you know, where your race has nothing to do. That's going to be the exception rather than the rule. Just a couple of planes here to start for Judge. Nelson with a Seeker of the Way as the first play of game number two here. A Case of Coilos and a passing of the turn. Devouring Light is online now here for Judge as he does slide one of those forward in his hand. He's at the ready as Nelson does take a look at his hand, figure out what he wants to do. As we learned last week, Heroic and Prowess, they work very well together. Yep. Now, this is a very subtle mistake from Tom, but I think this turn I would have preferred for him to play Nykthos rather than Kezakoilos because Brad is going to respect the possibility of removal a lot more facing against Plains Plains Caves than he would Plains Plains Nykthos. I can see that. As you mentioned, it does seem subtle. But if you're in Tom's spot, they're sitting on the Devouring Light, your ideal situation is that Brad loads up a bunch of enchantments onto his uh, Seeker, assuming that the coast is clear, and then you get to use that Devouring Light to, to really knock him back. It's Temple of Silence taking a look at a copy of Heliod. That's going to go to the bottom. And back to Nelson we go. You saw Nelson last turn play a Hero Virus. Nelson will draw a card here, see if he has any interest in moving in. That's kind of the unique thing about this deck as well is hey, these creatures are still just perfectly fine. They're two twos for two. Yep. Although, that might be you and I being old-timers to some extent. Two twos for two back when we were playing, that was a premium deal. A delight. And now, not really a thing. Here's Devouring Light. It's going to go after Seeker of the Way. See if Nelson has a response here. Again, we do know that he has four copies of God's Willing in his deck. He's going to cast a Defiant Strike, targeting Hero of Iroas. Heroic Counter is going to make that into a 3-3. Three, three. Seeker will be Devoured. And that will be Exiled, so we will... Uh, I mean, we'll get that out of the graveyard. And Brad has a lot of ways to blow up a Devouring Light. Not, a, not only that card, he has two copies of Feet of Resistance mm -hmm. alongside his four God's Willing. So 
It's dangerous, but Tom's got to do something. Temple of Enlightenment will come down post-combat. Nelson looks like he's going to leave the top card on top of his deck very quickly. He's considering probably playing something else. Here's the thing, though. Brad doesn't really know what he's up against. Think about what he saw last game. He saw Soldiers, he saw Nyx Fleece Ram, then Ember Maz. So four mana against a what looks to be a white control deck, that, that's at hostilities territory. Well, I think that Tom playing the Nykthos game one is a bit of a giveaway. Sure. Not that there are a lot of white devotion strategies, but if you play Magic Online two-person queues or an eight-person events, occasionally you'll run into the deck. I certainly did early on in Standard. So uh, Brad may not know exactly what he's playing against, but he probably has a, a reasonable idea what Tom's up to. It's a Soren. It has ticked down, provided Judge with a Vampire. It was interesting to see Tom last turn decide to go after the Seeker rather than the Hero. The Hero is a much more dangerous card. You've seen Brad pick up Ordeal of Thassa this turn, and that might be two cards drawn that maybe Tom could have prevented. Uh -huh. I'm also going to sculpt things out here. Because I think if Tom wins the game, it's going to be in a protracted game. It's going to be a lot of removal, and he's just going to deploy six mana cards. If Brad gains a couple points of life here or there, I don't think that matters too much in the scheme of things. It's not going to use form. That's well, going to come down here for Nelson. And now an ordeal of Thassa. So the hero is getting buff, and now it is attacking. We'll trigger a little bit of action here. There's a scry in Aquas's form, and then ordeal is going to bust. It does have counters. So things are getting mighty interesting now. Now this is what a heroic deck looks like. Yep. Looks like organizing the triggers here. So he's going to scry first, put that top card to the bottom. And now this will occur. Counter the, from the ordeal. Peel two cards. And now it's on time to decide what he wants to do, and he's going to let his Soren go. Not a lot to be done as four makes it unblockable. Yep. And now there's another hero. You can see how impressive this card is in this deck. It is the best enabler in my mind. Judge going to play a copy of Nykthos. So he does have six mana. We'll see if an Elspeth is here. It looks like it is. And there is the Sun's Champion. So that'll come down. Looks like it's going up right away. So I think in this spot, Tom probably needs to minus the Elspeth as the hero simply gets to take care of this for free. Yeah. Now, if Tom has some big plan with these tokens, that's different. But uh, unless he has some very powerful follow-up to, to do something with these tokens. Now, if he has Devouring Light, maybe that's an argument. I mean, it's risky because if Brad, Brad can blow it up with God's Will and your Feet of Resistance, but... That could be a huge tempo swing. And I believe that Judge does have a copy of Devouring Light in his hand. In which case, this play is risky, but makes sense. Yep. Now, the thing about playing a deck like Blue Heroic, or you know, a deck that a lot of people aren't familiar with or don't see very much, is you don't know the exact composition of the deck. For Judge, he doesn't know that Nelson does have access to all these protection effects and four gods willing and two copies of Feet of Resistance. So he might think that he's safe when that's certainly not the case. Well, Brad flashed a Feet of Resistance at the end of game one there to yep. say, hey, you can't block, I, I have you beat. So he knows about that. And if your opponent's playing Feet of Resistance, they're also probably playing with gods willing. Not 100% certainty, sure. but, you know, the cheapest version of that effect is usually what's the premium. Nelson going to go or reach in. Again, his auras are going to be very cheap this turn. Although Brad also has to respect the, the possibility of another Devouring Light at this point because he's already seen one, and Tom's play last turn was pretty suspicious. So Brad's probably trying to figure out some way to play around Devouring Light or at least diversify his assets and play a little bit so it's less punishing. And really, that's the only card he has to worry about, right? The opponent's tapped out as the creature's in play, so all he does is actually worry about is of our light. He's going to cast a Defiant Strike on his large hero. And now he's moving out. It looks like he might be trying to shove here. Ordeal of Thassa going to target this. So now it's an 8-8. He'll be attacking. There will be triggers, of course, just like last turn. So Tom needs to Devouring Light now with these triggers on. 
he does have one in his hand. Again, I don't know if Nelson has a protection spell or not. Here is the Convoke. You see him reaching for the creatures. That can only mean one thing. Yeah. I think he, Tom probably wants to know, does the does Brad draw the cards off the ordeal if the creature is killed with the trigger on the stack? Yeah. And you can see Nelson knows, okay, he's gonna, this creature's gonna bite the dust. He will get the scry from Aquas form. That's on the stack. Yeah, that trigger is not predicated on anything other than the creature attacking, <laughs> whereas Ordeal looks once the trigger resolves to see what the condition of the creature is. The hero should be ended. The rest of it should not. The Ban Trailblazer. That's a standard champion. I like that. Yeah, the 04 now carrying a trophy. Much like judges from there before it. Often mocked, but a winner. Temple of Silence is going to come down here. It's possible that Brad just came to the conclusion, well, I can't really do anything about Devouring Light, so hopefully it's not there. Judge reaching for a bunch of mana again. There is Heliod. It's almost on. But what might be more important here is that creature's having vigilance. We don't see this a lot. We do not. Heliod, the most maligned of the monocolor gods in Theros. Poor guy. You would think we have a little more respect for Heliod. Looks like there might be some blocks here. So there is some attacking. Elspeth is going to tick up. Three more soldier tokens are going to join us. And you can really see what the White Devotion Shell is capable of doing once it stabilizes the early game. It's power at five and six mana. I mean, there's a lot of excellent cards to choose from. And if you're trying to attack on the ground, it's, it, it can be challenging. So up to five soldiers working on Heliod's Devotion. Is Judge, he'll pass the turn back over to Nelson who will draw a card, but you can tell that Nelson's in some trouble now. A really good start, but a card like Devouring Light is quite good against this deck. It's a big tempo swing, especially on a turn where you're also playing an Elspeth and plussing it. Very good synergy between those two cards, that's for sure. Judge will draw a card, Nelson not a lot to do. And you talked about how if Judge is gonna win this game, it would be a protracted game, a long one. He's the control deck in this matchup. He's got a lot of power once the game drags out, especially if he has Nykthos in play. Cards, cards like Soul Theros, Elspeth, High Sentinels, very powerful cards if the game drags out. Speak of the soul, it shall appear, and it will get Nelson to concede the game. So Tom Judge is going to win game number two here. White, Black, Devotion, Blue, Black, Heroic. They're even up. We'll have a third game here in just a moment. And you can see the difference with Tom's deck when he has access to removal spells. I mean, g game one, he's at the mercy of Brad's draws with the exception of Th uh, three Banishing Lights in a suspension field. Post-board, he gets to bring in a lot more removal, and that might give him the time to get to his powerful five and six mana cards. Well, it is time to talk about SCG Game Night, my friend. It is November, after all, which means we've got a worm. New kits coming out every month. This is the November kit here, our worm token and pin. If you're interested in signing up stores, just head over to StarCityGames.com. We can get you set up. StarCityGames.com slash game night for more information. If you want to get the December kit, get on board now because we need a little bit of lead time. This program has been very successful, very popular, fun and friendly, casual play at your store, sanctioned or unsanctioned, any day of the week. Just get people in your store giving out these pins and these token cards. It is sweet as every week in November. It used to be every Wednesday, but now you can do it whatever day you want during the week. Whatever format you want, as Patrick did mention, sanctioned or unsanctioned. Star City Games, game night, starcitygames.com slash game night for more information. I have to do get ready for game number three here between Brad Nelson and Tom Judge, Blue White Heroic. We'll see if we see a lot of this on camera. Again, two very big name players in attendance in Tom Ross and Brad Nelson playing that deck. Of course, Tom Ross already qualified for our Players Championship. He's just kind of in town hanging out, getting ready for Grand Prix New Jersey. Brad Nelson, well, he's in the thick of things right now. Again, number 13 on our season four leaderboard. He is looking to get more Open Series points to qualify for our end-of-the-year tournament. We've also got some really big names here as well. Jeff Hoogler, number 9. Kent Ketter, number 11. Andrew Tenger, number 12. Eric Rill, number 16. Andrew Boswell, number 17. Todd Anderson, number 18. Among them, a lot of players here battling, climbing up the rankings. We've had some players like Anthony Lowry come from the New, the, uh, the New York area. Joe Bernal, Peter Tragos, those guys are from the Chicago area. So some traveling has definitely been done here. Pretty sweet.
Yep, and you can see those players, a lot of the ones that you mentioned are, you know, they are not currently qualified for the Players' Championship. We're at to end today. They would be on the outside looking in, yep. but it is feasible with the right breaks and attending all the events that they could find themselves in Roanoke at the end of the year. Yeah, a player like Anthony Lowry, number 28 on our Season 4 leaderboard right now, he has been playing in, like, virtually everything. Yeah. He's just been grinding IQs like crazy to try to get open series points. Jim Davis, uh, a player who's been doing the same thing, as well with blue white control recently after jeremy bylander's performance in minneapolis he's number 10 our open series leaderboard he's right in the thick of things as well wasn't sure if we were going to see jd here this weekend it's far yes it's far uh, from the new york area which is where he is from but you see lowry's here here's the thing I, I think that people and coverage has a lot to do with this get hung up on the people that are winning the events people who are top eight in the invitationals a lot of the players at the end of the year who are going to end up qualifying for the player championship it's going to be about as much about labor as it was necessarily doing well in every single event they played in feline longmore is a player who's within striking distance anthony lowry these are players who have done a lot of their work either by traveling to a lot of events or playing in iqs uh joe Lissette, his qualification has a lot to do with iqs i mean he's in california so his access to opens is limited it is feasible to qualify for the Players' Championship by doing a lot of work on the local level. And I think at the end of the year, we're going to see two or three players where were there open series resumes or invitational resumes that deep? Not necessarily, but the work they did at the local level led them to get qualified. Yeah, I think the perfect example of that is definitely Kevin Jones, a player who a lot of you know IQ victories and grinding IQs and people see him on the leaderboard, have no idea who he is. And it's like, no, actually, this guy's pretty good, as he showed in New Jersey. And also by winning the Legacy World Championships as well. Yeah, really good stretch there for, for him, winning the initial Open with Constant Tarkir Legal, with Jess Guy Agro. And his deck, people don't play that exact build anymore, but there were definitely kernels of good ideas there that have ported over to what the current builds of the oh, deck Oh, that was like. the groundwork. I mean, his, yeah. his deck felt like it may have been six or seven cards off for week one with a brand new format where you don't have a lot of time. That's very impressive. And as you mentioned, now the owner of a very sweet, framed, huge guy's cradle. Yeah. Based on his legacy champ win uh, last week, I believe, in Philadelphia. A couple, uh, it was a couple weeks ago. A couple weeks ago, he okay. went to Philadelphia for the, the Eternal Championships. But an impressive win, nonetheless, there for him as well, playing Blue Red Delver in that format. I imagine we will see a lot of that tomorrow. But we are not there yet. We are in standard action. As Judge will draw his opening hand, Nelson will do the same. We saw Brad take a mulligan last game. Does seem like a deck that will mulligan a decent amount. So Nelson going to lay it out. It looks like Judge may be deciding if he wants to mulligan or not. We'll see if he can get one of these nice heroic draws, protect himself from some of the removals. He's going to play a Temple of Enlightenment. Game number three is underway. A little scry action here. Tom's hand looks very expensive, and only two copies of Caves of Coilos as lands. It's a little painful, too. Needs some help. There's the first Caves. Back to Nelson will go. Nelson does have a, maybe he has a second land. There it is. It's another Temple of Light. You see him play a favorite Hoplite this turn. Great opening here for Brad. Has a threat. Mana fix. Got to do some scrying. Second caves and just a passing of the turn. Nelson will draw a card. It's a planes. We'll see how he wants to maybe set things up here. It's tough to figure out how you're supposed to deploy your threats, how you're deploy, supposed to deploy your auras, excuse me. Especially against a deck that's potentially representing a number of different removal spells. And a little bit of math here is Nelson. You can see he's got a copy of Ordeal of Thassa in his hand. An important card to keep the ball rolling. But when you're supposed to deploy it is a difficult question to answer. Also has a copy of Stratus Walk in his hand that looks like he may be considering. He also just may want to play a creature this turn yep. to minimize the impact of something like Last Breath. Yep. Looks like he's just going to attack for one. Let's see what the follow-up is here. It's a Seeker of the Way. <laughs> so there is the creature, as you did mention. Nothing from Judge. So just draw a card. Looks like it was a land. Very important third land there for Tom. I mean, his hand's very expensive. He has Devouring Light and Bramaz in hand, so land number three is a big deal. Planes does come down. So now the question is, is it a creature or is it a removal spell? I think that I prefer deploying the Bermaz this turn, 
Brad's radar is just going to be locked in right now on the possibility of removal, especially given that Tom played Devouring Lights last game. Yep. And Bramaz makes every, once you play the Bramaz, assuming that it survives, everything gets so much easier for you going forward. The fact that it synergizes with the Devouring Light in your hand is another factor. But I think that sitting on your heels of all this removal, Brad's going to be able to identify that that's what's going on, play around it, and make you use your mana a little less efficiently. Especially against a deck that's packing Feet of Resistance and most likely God's Willing. These are really dangerous turns here for Tom. First things first, the creatures will attack. Judge does slide a card forward in his hand. It is Devouring Light yet again. A very powerful last game. We'll see if it's good again this game. Shrugging of the shoulders, Judge is going to take three. He's going to go down to 16. A touch surprising. Trying to get more value, it looks like, out of his Devouring Light. And this was the risk of not playing Bermaz is, well, Brad's not going to do anything with these enchantments until mm -hmm. he has God's Willing or Feet of Resistance back up. Another Seeker, just the passing of the turn. Judge will draw a card. It looks like it may have another land. It is. It's a copy of Nykthos. The other risky thing about Tom's progression here is, well, he doesn't have more land drops in hand. If he draws a card and it's not a land, he's likely to discard. He'll have to take one to play the King of Oreskos, but it looks like that's what he's about to do. So there is a 3-4. And now playing against one mana, Brad can unleash hell. Well, it's kind of one mana. Devouring Light can still be cast here. Sure, sure. Yeah. It's in a roundabout way, but it can't happen. Here's Defiant Strike. That's going to resolve. You see him draw the card. Here's the ordeal. That'll trigger there. We can't forget as well, a bunch of prowess triggers. Yep. What do we have here? It's a copy of a race before attackers. So no cards will be drawn. Brad still gets to deal uh, quite a bit of damage yes, here. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. And these Seekers are four fours right now. Tom can go ahead and make a block here and trade one for one, but not the ideal use of Bermaz. Our now favorite Hoplite sitting at a 3-4. A touch surprise we didn't see Favorite Hoplite get into the red zone. Feels like a freebie. Yeah. Judge no blocks there. He's just going to go down to six. He will draw a card. Did not get a great look. It's a land. So there's a planes. Things have broken very nicely for Tom here. His hand was a little sketchy to start, but he's been making his land drops here and is in a position to start going on the offensive a little bit with Bermaz. base is a little bit painful. We do see the two copies of Caves of Koilos out there. There's a Banishing Light. Bye-bye Seeker. Now with the ability to cast Devouring Light, pretty easy. You have to imagine that's on Nelson's radar here. For sure. I mean, Tom's been, you know, he did nothing on turn three, thought about it for a while. Here's an attack. Definitely a card on Brad's radar again. See if Nils has any interest in blocking here. Because you do kind of open yourself up to Devouring Light on the defensive as well. Yes. And he does have two mana, and then he can use the cat token. Your favorite Hoplite's feeling a little frisky. And then Burma's still on defense, so it's now, a little bit interesting. If Brad has two spells to play next turn, then maybe he's fine blocking because then Tom most likely has to jump block with the Vermaz or risk dying. Looks like Nelson's just gonna take the damage. He is at 28 after all. He can afford to take the hit here. What's four life? Though I will say with, with Aqueous form in hand, I think that's a spot where Brad may wanna consider running a block on the token. Because if Tom goes ahead and uses Devouring Light to clear out the Hoplite, well, now the coast is clear next turn for Aqueous Form, which is really good for, for Brad here. Tom's shields are down, and he's only at six. There's a Hero of Iros. Or it's just got a little bit cheaper. 
And we can't forget Nelson has had that Stratus walk in his hand for a long time. And it looks like he may finally be casting Stratus walk. A fun of target for him to go get with the Heliots Pilgrim. Yeah, also, not, card he hasn't drawn yet. Also, not, not horrible just for him to draw. Yeah, no, flying's good. Yeah, flying's good. Ashkelon Phoenix and Stormwind Dragon have proven that. Flying is good. Yep. There it is. And there's a battle if you draw a card. Enchanted Creature has flying. Enchanted Creature can block only creatures with flying. You can get a little crafty. You can target their creature. Oh, yeah. You can get a little neat. Angles within angles. Yes. It does much more than you think. Nelson does draw a card off of that. And no attacks. Maybe Brad's committed to just waiting as long as possible until he has a protection effect, Feet of Resistance or God's Willing, and then doesn't have to worry about Devouring Light so much. Could also be a situation where he's hoping Judge makes a mistake. Sure, I think Brad's probably, with, with Light Tolls at 24-6, with Brad having a lot of huge draws, I think he's happy to let the board get developed. Always a dangerous thing to do against a deck with Nick, though, because you never know fully what they're capable of doing. But right now, Brad showing a lot of patience, which I think is correct here. You don't have to attack every turn. No. There is no rule that says you do. And I actually like the patience as well. If he's got some more setup to do. Here comes Maj yet again. Cat Token will be joining it. See if Nelson has interest in blocking this time. And it looks like he does. Very quickly sitting up in his chair. And the hero's gonna block the one one. That'll be dead. Nelson offering a helping hand. What a yep. nice guy. Thanks, buddy. Bunch of mana here. Judge is gonna take one, he's gonna go down to five. Looks like you might have a Soren incoming. We do. And that'll provide a flying blocker if Judge would like to, and he does. I would imagine so, yes. Again, has the necessary mana and creature requirements for Devouring Light in hand. He's looking at a race right now. No reason to make a move just yet. Not you can always take care of the enchantment before blocks are declared. And you would prefer to save that erase for something like an ordeal, Eidolon of countless battles, whatever. So good patience there by Tom. Heck, even a Stratus walk. Tom's clearly in a position where he's trying to feel out Brad's tricks too. You can see some hesitation, but he has mostly timed things the right way. And it's that unfamiliarity. Again, how many people do you think have played against Blue White Heroic? I can't imagine the list is very high. Exactly. Nelson has tapped a mana. I think he's just trying to figure out what he's going to do with it at this point. And he does have Aquas' form ordeal of Thassa in hand. His opponents also showed a race. I mean, Todd, Brad's got a lot of stuff to play around here, too. Yeah. And he certainly doesn't know Tom 75. I mean, he might have a general idea of what's going on here, but Brad's also trying to figure things out as he goes. Aquas' form going to target the favorite hoplite, of course, going to trigger heroic. It's not a thing as a 4-5. Looks like that's going to resolve. And now Nelson's going to go reaching. Don't forget, Prowess did trigger. Here is an attack. Seeker of the way, currently a 3-3 flyer. Favorite hoplite, unblockable. A little scry action, if he'd like, if he's given the green light to attack. It looks like he has been. There's the trigger on the form. So we'll see if Judge has any responses here as Nelson waiting patiently before scrying. And it looks like Judge does have the erase that he wants to use. He's going to target the Stratus walk. This is before blocks. Bit of feeling this may be coming. Yeah. And now, for if you're in Brad's spot, the writing's on the wall that Tom has Devouring Light in hand because there's no way he's targeting the Stratus walk here on your smaller creature instead of the aqueous form on your larger creature unless he intends on killing your larger creature inside of combat. So there is a race. Bye-bye goes the Stratus walk. Exiled, of course. 
Here's your scry. I think you might see Tom here shove with everything as a block on Seeker of the Way. Probably pretty safe. Well, uh, you're probably going to kill it. You know, you might lose your Bermaz if Brad has another spell, but I think that's a cost Tom should be willing to pay given how much power is in his hand. I think he has an Elspeth, a Reprisal. Like, it's got a lot of juice. So I don't think he needs to lean on this Bermaz. He can put everything in front of Seeker and just try to get as much of Brad's stuff off the table as possible. Top card to the bottom. Just one block. A little surprising. Well, this still requires two spells out of Brad to be able to fully blow him out here, but I think it's... I think I would have thrown at least the cat token that you have hanging around that's not really do anything on top of. Yeah. Here's your D-Light. The big question now... Does Nelson have any way to protect this creature? The answer is yes, Ooh. he does. Yes, he does. That is a stubborn denial. It's also going to grow the Seeker the way until a 4-4. It'll take care of Ramaz. The cat token will still stay around, but stubborn denial takes care of that removal spell. Mm. Very well done. So damage just go across there. Judge a little bit lower. We did mention Judge looks to have a copy of Reprisal in his hand, among other toys. But it looked like Nelson was more interested in getting Soren off of the table as the lifelink could provide a huge problem in, the, in this racing situation that we are obviously in. Correct. So that's why you no longer see the Planeswalker in play and Judge still at five. Hoplite right now, however, is a four power creature, so it only takes one more though. Reprisal from out of nowhere will take care of that. So Nelson's got to rebuild again. Like I said, it's a funny characteristic of this matchup. Reprisal and Last Breath both very good against Brad. Yeah. Not often the decks line up that way. See Judge's hand. He's got Nelspeth over there among other things, but it's Nelson's turn right now. Tom is a land away from having a huge edge here. Yeah. And again, if you're Nelson, you see an opponent with some untapped mana, some untapped creatures. Who's shown all sorts of different removal spells. Yep. I mean, at this point, now with the reprisal, I would have no idea what to play around. I don't know if you can play around anything. Cross your fingers, just hope they have nothing, maybe. Here's Nylon of Countless Battles. That'll trigger. Here's an attack. That's an erase. Now, here it was a 3-3 right now. I think this is still worth a chump block if you're Tom. You have Elspeth at hand, and the biggest risk is you take this hit, and then Brad has some protection effect, some can't block effect, and your Elspeth doesn't stabilize the game. Looks like he may have taken the damage. He is down to two. Tranquil Co is going to come into play for Nelson. He goes up to 24. We're headed back. Judge's way. Did not get a great look at the draw step. I believe it was Heliod. I believe you are correct, as there is four mana, and there is Heliod. Perhaps a sigh of relief here. Creatures do have Vigilance. In we go. An attack for four. Nelson going to quickly untap, draw a card. Manic influences what he's found. So the fifth land, probably not something he needs at this point, but there is Nakuis's form. Trigger Heroic. Follow up. It's Ordeal Thassa. It's clear he's moving in. Yep. And that is going to do it. Brad Nelson going to win this match over Tom Judge. Two games to one. Blue White Heroic going to get the job done here over White Black Devotion. For Nelson, again, number 13 on our season four leaderboard. He is in the hunt right now for the Players' Championship. His good friend Tom Ross already qualified. They worked on this deck together. And we'll see if Tom was able to pick up a win or not. But Nelson off to a great start in this, yes, 